This video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're in need of a portfolio, blog, or online store, Squarespace has all the website building, marketing, and analytics tools you'll need to create a stunning website and grow your brand. Hi, a lot of my channel has consisted of me trying to take the nonsense that I do in my spare time and somehow turn it into content. I've managed to do it with cosplay, sewing, and turning abstract concepts into hot women, but I've been hard pressed to find an avenue that will allow me, a non-writer of average intelligence, to talk to you at length about all of the movies, music, and TV shows I'm consuming. That is... Until now. Uh, oh, what's this? This is my dog. Oh. Because welcome to Screen Cap Redraw, or whatever it is I'm gonna call it. A show where I redraw iconic moments from my favorite things, a series I have devised solely as an excuse for me to rant about them on YouTube.com. And in honor of volume two of season four coming out and breaking my heart, today we're gonna be talking about Stranger Things. And I'm going to be redrawing an iconic moment from each of the four seasons with full spoilers, because while I do, I'm going to be rambling about volumes one and two of season four, because oh boy, do I have a lot to talk about. But first, I have something to show you. It's a digital get well card for Max because I'm sad. And I made it with this video sponsor, Squarespace. Call me Paul Blart Mall Cop because boy am I good at riding those segues. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when TV shows nearly kill off my beloved fictional characters, I feel the need to express myself a little bit. But I'm also a busy lady and these shenanigans take time. Thankfully, Squarespace's easy to use website customization allowed me to whip up this heartfelt nonsense in a little over an hour. But if you're in need of a website for actual business purposes, Squarespace offers dozens of professional and customizable website and portfolio templates tailored to the needs of artists, bloggers, and merchants. I also created my portfolio using Squarespace, and despite being a literal dunce whenever it comes to website design, their convenient features like automatic image scaling allowed me to upload a ton of my portfolio pieces, which were then automatically beautifully arranged, and I didn't have to do anything. In fact, designing my whole website was incredibly simple. I could fully customize my site colors, fonts, and even add different pages, like a contact page for potential clients and even a page for an online store. Because yes, for those of you who have things to sell, like myself, Squarespace offers a fantastic e-commerce platform that can link directly to your portfolio site. And Squarespace's high connectivity allows me to link my print-on-demand service directly to my Squarespace store so that I don't have to be hands-on while fulfilling orders. And speaking of being hands-off, I can also connect my Squarespace site to my various social media accounts and use a social block to automatically share recent social media posts on my Squarespace site. So now I'm able to have my portfolio and my Instagram gallery in one convenient location. So if you want to begin your passion project or just create some fun nonsense, head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, head to squarespace.com slash alpaca to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for returning to sponsor the channel. Now let's get started. So I thought about showing you guys the screenshots I was going to redraw at the top of the video, but then I decided not to do that because I want it to be a surprise. But we are starting off with a screenshot of Elle versus the Demogorgon from the end of season one. Oh my gosh, look at that. It's your dad. But to get right into it, if for some reason you're new here and you haven't seen Stranger Things and for some reason you're still watching this video, what are you doing? Why are you here? It's a fantastic show. It's really good even if you're not particularly like a sci-fi or horror or Steven Spielberg person, it's still just a really fun watch, really strong character moments, and just a whole lot of amazing cinematography and colors and fun outfits and fun character chemistry and just spectacle. Like, it's a great show if you want a lot of good set pieces and like really good character moments. So you can watch this if you want to, but if you haven't seen the show, and specifically if you haven't seen season four, go watch it because I don't want to spoil it for anyone because it's fantastic and you should experience it for yourself. So you have once again been warned for spoilers. So my thoughts on season four overall, I loved it, girl. It absolutely blew me out of the water. Like I'll be honest, the last couple of weeks, 
my head has been like head empty only Kenobi because for whatever reason watching Kenobi got me so upset for the first like four or so episodes that I became obsessed and I just had to like get myself preoccupied with it and figure out what other people were talking about. Like I was watching the streams, I was watching all the theory videos just because in the back of my mind, I was like, this show is so lackluster that I need to figure out why, you know? And then episode five and six of that kind of brought me back and my overall opinion of it is pretty positive. That was a tangent, but that sort of like caught me off guard for a while. And you know, now that I've seen volume two of Stranger Things 4 and I've like been able to sit with it a little bit, it's hidden me again, just how amazing season four was and just how good it is. I think even compared to seasons two and three, like no shade to those seasons, but if we're talking scope, and just how much they accomplished in one season in terms of plot and characters and just payoffs. Like, paying things off from season one, I think they did so much more in season four than they've done in both of the other seasons. I think for me and my ranking, it definitely comes in, like, season one is maybe the top season just by a small margin. But then my favorites are probably season four, season three, and season two. I don't know, three and two like flip flop because to me they're kind of like on the same general scale of quality. They're just, uh, they serve different purposes. Season two is a little bit more like serious and we're continuing the story. And then for some reason, season three was like, all right, we're gonna just have a summer blockbuster film and we're gonna have big old flesh monsters in here for no reason. It just seemed like they were there to have a fun time and they were there to just throw knock off Arnold Schwarzenegger in it. So it's like, I, I don't know, the way that this show has progressed season to season is really like, interesting and really weird because seasons two and three, whenever I was watching them, I was like, okay, I see what we're doing. Like we kind of peaked season one, right? In terms of like high brow storytelling. The other seasons are good, no shade. I really enjoy them. I love this show. I know a lot of people were like, oh, it should have ended after season one. They ruined it after season one. Listen, you don't have to watch it anymore. If season one is like all you needed, then just don't watch it after season one. That might be what I do with Squid Game because I'm like, why are you guys making more Squid Game? This is clearly a one season concept anyways. But like, I think that season four shows that there is more story to tell. And I think the fact that they got more time to actually sort of dive in and flesh it out and tell that story due to COVID. I think it's one of the reasons why season four seems like it had a lot more love and care put into it as opposed to seasons two and three, just because I think, you know, the pressure of the scheduling and the fact that with Netflix and a lot of these studios, you kind of like want to get things out fast so that hype doesn't die down and you have like these strict deadlines. I think it kind of hurt the story a little bit. That is just purely speculation on my part. Like, I really don't know what's going on with the Duffers, but it really seems like this season, the writers and, you know, the directors and everyone, everyone involved was really able to just dig their feet in and make the very best thing that they could make. And, you know, I have been seeing a couple people online who are like, oh, I'm disappointed in like volume two. It wasn't what I expected. It wasn't as good as I thought it would be. And I'm over here like, did we watch a different show? Because hello, that was incredible. That had me on the edge of my seat. Are you kidding me? Like they just hit us with two extra movies for the finale, like straight up. Whenever you break it up, it's like an hour and a half and then two and a half hours. That breaks down to like two, two hour movies. That's insane. Like 
Oh my gosh. Wait, no, that's even longer than two two-hour movies. I can't do math, but that's not the point. The point is that I think the phrase movies is like the key here. Because I think that Stranger Things is taking advantage of an aspect of streaming that people haven't really tapped into yet. And that is like the run times. With streaming, you can have these run times that aren't consistent episode to episode and run times that are super long, like we got with episode nine, the finale. And with those longer run times and run times that vary, I think you can really tell the story that you're intending to tell because TV writing and TV lengths are just so particular and specific, especially whenever you have to cut things to be like a similar length for every episode or you have to cut things in order for something to be paced well or for it to be cohesive. There's just like a lot of extra character moments that are filmed that I think meet the cutting room floor a lot of times. And I think Stranger Things season four was able to strike a really good balance between pacing things well and giving us those slower character moments that are so important to a story that is as character driven as this one. Like Stranger Things at its core is not all about plot. It is about characters. It's a story about Eleven and this group of kids and the teens and parents in Hawkins specifically, and even Hawkins, the town, is a character. That's why we care that Hawkins is being destroyed at the end of season four. Like, we don't care because it's the end of the world. We care because we know this town and we know these characters. Like, I can't tell you how many times while watching the finale, I can't think of that many like specific examples at the moment, but a lot of times while watching it, we got slower moments or these moments where in the back of my mind, I was like, oh wait, we get to see this? Normally we would cut away or we would play this a little bit faster, but it was able to just slow down and breathe and we can just watch characters have a conversation and it's not boring and it means something because these characters have been built up for so long like the conversation between mike and will whenever like uh, will was telling him that he's the heart of the group and he holds them together that was such a good scene and when you think about it it's just a scene where two people are talking in the back of a van but it means so much for their characters it has so many implications for will specifically another scene that comes to mind is at the end whenever eddie's uncle is looking at the poster of him and there's like a pentagram on it he goes to put up a new one and dustin stops him and tells him about how his uh, nephew died heroically and how if people got to knew him they would have really loved him like Eddie was a relatively minor character in the grand scheme of the show but he was so prominent this season even though he was killed off like too early in my opinion but we were able to really feel the weight of his death even though I have a couple of issues with his death and why they killed him, we were still able to feel the weight of it and we got that moment of catharsis of like watching his uncle, another very minor character, get closure on his death. And by extension, of course, it gave Dustin closure on his death and gave him the opportunity to sort of like tell someone what a great person Eddie was because it just doesn't seem like a lot of people realized it, at least not until it was too late. But is he really dead? I don't know, you didn't show me a fully dead body, I mean you did, but I, I don't know. It seems like they left him in the upside down, which is like, first of all, super morbid, but second of all, does that mean that he's gonna get all reanimated and weird in season 5? Because I feel like characters are gonna get reanimated and weird in season 5, I don't know seems like it's on the table. But getting back to my point, I think Max is another character that got a lot of like longer, slower scenes to focus on building her up for the arc that she was going to go on this season. I think that her arc was like the emotional linchpin. It was what got everyone invested and her ending was like absolutely devastating. I'm not okay, as you can like see from earlier in the video, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm going to do basically a whole little section of this video on just the Max stuff because her stuff was probably my favorite of the whole season. Aside from some stuff with Eleven, her stuff was also like fantastic. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I do want to talk a little bit about the filmmaking and storytelling in this season because I thought it was really solid. 
I thought the way they were able to balance this huge cast of characters was really impressive, and I think they developed a really good method to do it by breaking it up into basically different little mini movies across four different locations and four different storylines, which of course play into the themes of the season with Vecna going after four victims and the whole like four horsemen of the apocalypse thing. And the Duffer brothers have definitely talked about how this season they basically handled it like four different individual movies and each movie had its own feeling and genre, which I thought was super cool. But I also noticed that each quote unquote movie also kind of got its own set piece that felt really unique in terms of like the filmmaking and style of it and like we had our horror movie in Hawkins with Max and Vecna and the stuff with Victor Creel which I thought was super cool it was very much Nightmare on Elm Street and of course Victor Creel's older actor was the same actor that plays Freddy Krueger which I thought was very cool, fun Easter egg there. And of course, I think the set piece for this arc was pretty obvious. It was the end of episode four with the running up that hill scene because everyone just went crazy for it. I personally went mad for it to the point where Spotify called me out and was like, you're in the top 5% of listeners to Kate Bush for this month. And I was like, wow. Thanks. You didn't have to expose me like that. But then over in California, we had our like fun summer blockbuster action weed movie. I don't know what genre this is, but the set piece for that for me was definitely that gunfight winner from whatever episode that was. It was just so energetic in the way it was filmed. Like I watched a featurette about it from the director talking about how they did it. And they were talking about how it was kind of a last minute decision. And he just kind of got this idea from reading the script uh, of how he wanted to look and how he wanted to film it and he was like hey brothers duff i think there's an opportunity for a oneer in the script here and they had to put it together really quickly but they made it happen and it took like i don't know seven takes to get it right because with a oneer if anyone messes up or misses their mark or their cues uh, it's it's ruined and you can't use that take. So I thought that scene was super cool. Like it definitely stayed with me immediately after I saw it and it caught me off guard like crazy the first time I watched it because I'm pretty sure it went from a relatively slow scene with Mike and Will to that. And I was just like, whoa, wait a second. We're doing this in Stranger Things? That's insane. That's incredible. And I think the fact that these directors that are directing in this Steven Spielberg sci-fi genre, we're able to go and just like bust out a really well-directed action scene when that's not really what the show has ever been. There's been some strong action sequences, but nothing ever quite like this. And a wonder is always a huge challenge to direct. So props to them. I think one of this season's biggest strengths is how they were able to meld so many genres into one season of television, especially in just nine, albeit long episodes, which of course brings me to the very cerebral sci-fi movie that's going on with Eleven this season. It's very much serving Cold War, CIA, shady government nonsense. And I think there was also some really cool non-linear storytelling happening in there. Even though it's technically linear and how Eleven is re-experiencing these events that she forgot, the cutting and the editing can be like really challenging. Honestly, it was a little bit difficult for me to keep up with it at some point to figure out, okay, wait, what is Eleven experiencing now? And what is a memory? Because at first some of the scenes with Brenner, because honestly, Brenner didn't look all that different, were a little bit difficult for me to track in place when they were actually happening. But once I got into the pattern of, okay, this is the past, we're re-experiencing the past. She's in the Nina sensory deprivation tank. I was finally like, okay, I gotcha. I see what you're doing. But in terms of editing and cutting footage like that together, especially whenever it's like, okay, they cut off Eleven's hair and that's how she looked in the flashbacks. She doesn't even look that different now. How are you supposed to like track that as a viewer? That can be very difficult to pull off. I think they did a really good job of cutting that footage together, even though it was non-linear and not chronological. And let me just say also, very impressed with their younger 11 CGI. Like 
uh, you can obviously tell that it's CGI in a lot of places, but it doesn't quite fall into the uncanny valley for me the way a lot of you know, de-aging and CGI of the face often does. I know they used a younger body double for those scenes, but I'm curious about what they actually did for the CGI, whether it was just a full CG model that they mapped onto her face, or if they used that in a combination with some deep fake. I'm guessing that they used both like CG mapping in a combination with deep fake because that's sort of what it looked like. Kind of reminded me of what they did with Luke Skywalker and the Book of Boba Fett. That's just speculation on my part, but I'm definitely overall very impressed with like all of the VFX this season. And speaking of effects and spectacle in my opinion the set piece for this part of the story was definitely when eleven just like pulled that helicopter down on the military vehicles and just blew it all up Mwah, beautiful amazing this is the kind of action nonsense that i'm here for like listen i know that stranger things can be one of those shows that people level criticism against because it's like oh this moment was just there for the spectacle or this sequence was just a music video it was just there to look cool yeah what's your damage heather like it's cool just let people watch cool things okay but even though this was a cool moment it wasn't without its emotional weight because this was the first time that eleven really used her powers on this big of a scale and it's the first time that she really used them since she got her powers back. So it was like, our girl is leveling up. It's an important moment. And she's also enraged because the government is coming after her to try to kill her or lock her up again. It was a good character moment and it was super cool. And then it was followed up by a really good reunion of the characters and the two storylines converging, which was super sick. Loved that. And finally... Hello, Russia. There's a Russian plotline in Stranger Things, which if you had told me that was a thing after I had seen season one, I would have been like, yeah. You've been talking to Argyle about his mushrooms, haven't you? But it's a thing and it's weird to say, but I think it actually works. It didn't seem too out of place from some of the shady government dealings that we got in season one. It kind of felt like that only were in Russia now, which admittedly it was a little rocky getting there. I think Murray and Joyce getting captured so easily and trusting Yuri was like maybe a little bit of a stretch. I think under the circumstances, I personally would have been a lot more cautious and not just gone and drank some random Russian smuggler's coffee, but okay, I guess. He seemed nice and charismatic. He's probably trustworthy, whatever. I guess if I was that desperate to get a loved one back, maybe I would be a little impulsive too, but it seems like a little bit of a stretch and just how Murray and Joyce got to Russia was a little weird, a little crazy. Like they crashed a plane and they, all three of them, they were basically fine. Um, I'm not an expert on small passenger plane crashes, but again, seems like a little bit of a stretch. Like that's where the disconnect happens for me in the Russia plotline, just like getting Murray and Joyce from the US to Russia to the prison, which is, you know, I don't know. It just doesn't seem like something you should be able to do, but hey, it's the eighties, right? Things were different, I guess. Uh, but the other little hole for me there just felt a little bit weird for Hopper to escape and get all the way to that church just for them to go and recapture him. It just felt like, oh, we're given the plot this much just for us to like walk it back a little bit. I think the biggest thing that it did was give Hopper an ally within the prison, his, his prison guard friend that eventually sort of helps him escape finally. But beating around the bush a little bit was worth it to see what I am dubbing the Colosseum scene where we finally get to see a Demogorgon rip a bunch of people apart which was so sick to finally see a Demogorgon. It's been since basically season one, if you don't count the little teasers that we saw that had the Demogorgon in them. This is definitely sort of the highlight set piece of the Russia arc for me personally, but it kind of does have me wondering, is there just one Demogorgon? Because like, 
Have we even seen more than one? Am I crazy? Because I'm pretty sure that the Russians had demodogs frozen in their little Jurassic Park amber tees, whatever that was. And yeah, I just went back into the episode and checked and Russia, they only have one demogorgon and the rest are demodogs. So it's like, is this the same demogorgon that we saw in season one? Is there only one? If so, why is there only one? And I feel like we actually saw that in one of the flashbacks with one to when he actually first ended up in the upside down, we see the demogorgon walking past him. I don't think it's a demodog. I'm pretty sure it's a demogorgon because you can see it walk away on two feet at the end of the shot. I could be wrong, but if the demogorgon that ended up in Russia is the same demogorgon that we saw L defeat at the end of season one, then it's like, how'd it get there? If the fact that L ended up back in the upside down after the end of season one is any indication and what happened to one is any indication, whenever she did that, it just got blasted back to the upside down. So it's like, did they get it from opening their gate? But they hadn't opened the gate yet. What's going on? Is there a gate in Russia? Am I missing something? Do we know if there's a gate in Russia? I don't know. It's just confusing. What are they up to over there? But against all odds, the Russia plotline actually ended up being pretty interesting. I know that in season five, they're gonna have so much to balance and so many loose ends to tie up considering it is gonna be the final season, but I genuinely hope that that comes together to be an important plot line because otherwise it's like, what's the point of including that? Just so that we can banish Hopper to Russia for a season and then bring him back? Like, come on, let's do something with it. Let's make it interesting. But I have faith in the writers. I know that the government shenanigans are a big deal, especially for that era with the Cold War and everything. So I know that the US government and the Russian government are probably going to play at least somewhat of a part in the end, especially since someone somewhere in the scientific community within this universe knows that that is not an earthquake. Like seismologists, hello? That's not how earthquakes work. That's a cover up and the government knows something fishy is going on. But anyways, to wrap up my talk about the season as a whole, finally, I wanna discuss the cinematography a little bit because it was a really big standout this season. It's excellent every season, but I think this season they used it a lot in terms of storytelling, like a visual storytelling with the lighting and the camera moves. I noticed a lot, especially in the first episode, that almost every shot had some kind of clever transition to the next scene and especially the montage with the basketball game and the D&D game was just really well done, really enjoyable to watch. Uh, whenever a show stylizes its filmmaking, I'm a sucker. I'm here for it. I love it whenever we go a little bit beyond shot reverse shot and we do something interesting to show like what the emotion of the scene is and what the environment is like. And I noticed especially in the season, there was also a lot of stuff that just integrated like the different genre blending into how it was shot. Whenever they wanted to evoke a certain genre, they kind of switched the filmmaking style a little bit to give you a little bit of a nod or a reference. I think you can definitely Definitely see that with how the showdown between Elle and the helicopter was shot. It just kind of evoked that sort of Indiana Jonesy Spielberg feel. And then when Nancy and Robin went to see Victor Creel, it was like Silence of the Lambs. And then Max's nightmare sequences felt like a nightmare on Elm Street. But then so many of the scenes with the boys in California felt funny and lighthearted with Argyle being just total stoner vibes. So the filmmaking felt a little bit more evocative of like a team drama from the time, like Ferris Bueller day off or another John Hughes film. All the genre blending really worked to make this season feel cohesive even though there was so much happening at once and there were so many plot threads to follow at once. But overall, I really liked how this season turned out. It was extremely character driven and there's a real focus on hitting all the emotional beats for the prominent characters. Even though some of the main characters felt a little bit more minor than they did in the past, I think they did a really good job of giving each of the characters a lot of really resonant emotional moments. Maybe not everyone went through a full arc, but you got the feeling that everyone had some real stakes in what was going on, except for maybe like Jonathan. I feel like Jonathan was 
the least significant character in this season and it was because he was just basically stoned the entire time i mean we got to see and experience so little of what was going on in his head and i just didn't really get the sense that he was important or that he cared almost the entire time which leads me into the more character focused side of our discussion here beginning with the snubbing of the buyer's boys like, I don't really get this. I do get it in the sense that it's like, what do you even do with them this season? Because there's just so much going on, it would be impossible to create a significant plotline for every character. But it is a little weird for Will and Jonathan to be relatively minor characters when Will was kind of the catalyst of the entire show, like him getting kidnapped in season one is the reason why this is a thing. And Jonathan had like a really prominent character arc in season one because his brother was gone. And since then, he's been little more than a love interest for Nancy, who, in my opinion, is a much better developed character. And even Nancy's other love interest option at this point, Steve, is a little bit better of a character, I think, in my opinion. And even her third love interest option, Robin, I think is maybe more interesting at this point, but we'll get into that later. And don't even get me started on Will. They did little more with my baby boy this season than make him suffer and give relationship advice to his unrequited love while he silently cries in the corner. I mean, this is just gut-wrenching stuff. And I think this character arc is interesting, the one where it's like, okay, we're finally exploring. He probably has a crush on Mike and it's really hard for him to watch Mike clearly be in love with someone else and he kind of knows, wow, I have literally no chance here. But the fact that he doesn't get to do a whole lot else, it just makes his character arc really sad. I mean, I really like the bonding moment. I think it's in episode nine where Jonathan can clearly see, okay, I think I know what's going on here. The signs are all there. Buddy, you can talk to me. We need to like get close and reconnect because we haven't talked like we used to because I've been stoned out of my mind. That was literally the most Jonathan got to do like all season other than be indecisive about where he wants to go to college and be worried about his relationship with Nancy, which we know ain't working out for him. Like our boy has got nothing going for him right now other than a good relationship with his baby brother. I hope he has more to do in season five as well as Will because I feel like they were kind of just pushed off to the side in favor of other characters this season, which is fine because we got to see development for other characters this season that needed to be developed, like Max and Lucas and Robin and Steve and Nancy and basically everyone else but the buyer's boys. But I wanna see a good end for the character arc for Jonathan and I really hope they don't just kill him off because that's sort of what I thought they were going to do with Steve because I was like it's done they have nothing left to do with this character I love him Steve is like my favorite character but what does he have going for them and then they opened up the can of worms with it's like okay he's in love with Nancy again and now I'm like okay they didn't kill him this season they might kill him off next season but I kind of doubt it could be Jonathan if they decide you know what we don't care about him. He has nothing going for him. Let's kill him. I don't know. I doubt the writers are going to go that fast and loose with their characters. I know that they're a lot more thoughtful with this show, but I'd like to see them do more. And I would especially like to see Will do more. Like after he got possessed in season two, I thought sure that he was maybe going to get powers or something was going to happen to him in supernatural terms that would allow him to have more insight into what's going on. And we saw a little bit of that in season three, like he can still feel the mind flare. But other than that, it does doesn't seem like they're doing a whole lot with Will's character and that feels weird to me because I'm almost positive there's foreshadowing with him being like a wizard in D&D &D and Will the Wise like he's gonna get powers right you guys have been kind of dropping hints about that and I don't know why you wouldn't go that route because I think it would be really cool 
I also think it would be really cool if Max got powers of some sort, not on Eleven's level at all, but some kind of ability that would help them in the fight because it's like victims that got away from Vecna or the Upside Down, I think should take something back with them. You know what I mean? But we didn't see much Upside Down Vecna stuff with Will this season and last season, it's like almost a meme at this point. All he does is mope around and be like, guys, can we play d and D? I I don't want to kiss girls. I want to play d and which I feel that. But I want to see you do more. I want him to get superpowers. And I'm glad he's exploring other avenues like painting. That painting was really cute. But can we like get this boy some mage powers, some plot relevance, and a hug? I feel like only terrible things happen to him. I don't know. If it was me, I would be utilizing Will Byers a lot more because I think his character just has a lot of unique experience in this universe. He's not maybe the most exciting character, but he's been through an awful lot. And speaking of characters who have been through a lot, who have been through way too much, this brings us to our dark horse girl of the season, Max Mayfield, my new daughter. I would die for her. Could I please do so? I am so concerned for the safety of this fictional child. I haven't mentally mothered a character the way I've mothered Max in this season in like a while. Where are your parents? But yeah, we all know it, a general standout, an absolute queen, and she didn't deserve it. She didn't deserve anything that happened to her, and oh my gosh, what are they gonna do in season five? What are they gonna do? I mean, we all know that like she had her triumphant win at the end of episode four. Whenever I watched that, there was an absolute mental collapse. I was sitting there like, this is art. This is what art looks like. An 80s song and some slow motion running. This is, this is art. But then the writers saved her from that only to have the audacity to actually kill her. I, albeit temporarily at the end of episode nine, and then she's in a coma. You're really gonna do that to me. How dare you? How dare you? You, you pay for my therapy bills, okay? But all jokes aside, her character arc this season has been really interesting. I was definitely wondering at the end of season three, okay, Billy's dead. Are they actually going to explore that grief with Max? Because obviously this is gonna have a profound impact on her. She's so young and watching a brother die like that is extremely traumatic. And thankfully they did, they explored it, I think in full and it was a huge plot point this season. So that was like really awesome on the writer's part to see. And it was totally gut-wrenching to see her survivor's guilt whenever she was trying to bait Vecna into possessing her again at the end of episode nine. She was talking about, you know, sometimes I want to die. I think I deserve to die. And it's like, you know, obviously people who experience grief probably have those feelings of survivor's guilt and sometimes might think hey it should have been me instead so that definitely felt very real and just a really dark premise for a lot of the horrific themes in this season just for vecta to go after people who have been traumatized, who are experiencing severe guilt. It just kind of makes me wonder, what is his goal with this as a villain? You know, Brenner was talking about how he absorbs the people that he kills, how they become part of him. So how does that benefit him? What does he get out of absorbing people who have experienced so much guilt and trauma? Like that doesn't seem like the most powerful thing to absorb, but maybe it's the negative emotion. Maybe in some ways he feels guilty about murdering his family and that plays into it. I don't know. Because he was talking to Eleven and he was like, we're similar, we're alike. And then later he ended up going after her for her powers and abilities. So maybe that plays into it, but there has to be a reason why he chose those particular people. But getting back to Max, I think it was really interesting how we got to see her life adjust after Billy's death and see just how much of an impact it had on her, on her family, even her like socioeconomic status changed and like she and her mom had to move into a trailer park, which it's like kind of stark contrast to where she lived before because it seemed like she had a pretty sort of like average looking bedroom and she lived in a decently nice house in a nice neighborhood. So it must have been so hard for her 
to endure the loss of a brother and then also have basically her entire surroundings change and then her father figure also leave. And then she has to grow up and become the parent because her mother isn't present anymore because she's self-medicating with alcohol. That's just wild. That's just so much to deal with as I don't know, what, a 16 year old or something like that. And it just hits me in a very real place because I know people who've grown up in similar circumstances. And you can see it's just these circumstances that force Max to grow up way too quickly. Where just a season ago, she was wandering around the mall with her friend buying clothes and having fun. And this season at the end, she has to sacrifice herself and act as bait for the greater good. Like. That's wild. That is insane for these children to have to go through, but you really feel it in this show because of how it's written. And this is kind of a side note, but I think it's interesting how Max is flashing back to those particular moments that we saw with her friends from season three and earlier, because it's like from one side, you can tell, okay, they're probably flashing back to those moments because it's like, that's the film they have. They don't want to have to go and refilm things. And it's just a quick montage. But I think the way it's used is also really insightful because it tells you that those moments are really the happiest Max has ever been. And she might not actually have a lot of really happy memories because her home life was just so trash. But in the midst of all the extreme sadness for Max this season, at least we got to see her interactions with her friends and see how her bonds have grown, especially with Eleven and Lucas. I love her friendship with Eleven. It is so pure and so wholesome. And I love how prominent of a role that played in her escaping Vecna. Like there are a lot of flashbacks specifically to her and Eleven, just as many as there were with her and Lucas, which I think is great because best friends are just as important as boyfriends. And I also like that this season kind of took Lucas and Max back to a friend zone level and we got to see their interactions as friends outside of romantic partners or whatever because they are kind of barely a thing in season three, even because they had like sort of broken up. That was sort of the joke, but I think you know, they had a very surface level high school sort of dating situation in season two and three. And now we're getting to see a little bit more depth to their relationship and see that they have a really strong bond outside of the usual high school drama that we see them engage in. They're actually really good friends and you can see how much they care for each other even though they are broken up at this point. And I also of course love the depth that we're getting on Max and Eleven's friendship. Like Max was kind of the first person that Eleven did normal friend things with even though she did do some friend things with like the little D&D &D group. She just went to the mall with Max and they bought clothes and they ate ice cream. So it's like kind of the first time that Eleven got to feel like a normal teenager. And it's the first time that Eleven had someone encourage her to be herself and sort of engage in her own taste and style sensibilities. So I love that we got to see how broken up Eleven was about Max dying and then subsequently going and basically saving her life. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how that's gonna pan out in season five. I know that Eleven is going to have a lot to do with bringing Max back. And I'm really interested to see how that relationship and Max's relationship with Lucas impacts her recovery and to see like, hey, maybe that can aid in bringing her back because we know that happy memories and positive things are sort of the antithesis to what Vecna is doing. And this is kind of an aside, but I think it's really interesting to see that Eleven was kind of looking for another friend like Max when she moved to California. And when she got there, I'm sure she was expecting the girls at her high school to sort of be fun and accepting the way Max was and go to the mall and do those fun things because that's all she knew. That's how Max was. Max was a good person and a good friend. And then to get faced with Angela and all these bullies and these girls who didn't treat her that way, who treated her like a freak and a monster, must have been absolutely devastating for her. And I think that's one reason why Max and Eleven's friendship is so strong because Max was kind of one of the first girls to treat her like a normal person, like a human being when so many people in her life haven't treated her that way at all. I think that's one reason why she's so strongly bonded with all these people in her life, like Mike and Hopper and Joyce and Will, because they finally treat her like a person with autonomy instead of a specimen and a freak. So there was just a lot of really strong development for our girls this season. And speaking of Eleven, her relationships are just getting more emotional for me, honestly. 
like seeing her and Mike go through their drama this season was a little bit like, I wasn't sure exactly the direction they were going in. I was kind of thinking at first, okay, maybe they're gonna end up breaking them up. Maybe Mike's not that interested in her anymore. High school relationships normally don't last, but I actually really like the direction they ended up going in. The inferiority Mike feels kind of is a direct parallel to Will, so I thought that was really interesting. That's why Will was able to encourage him and build him up so much whenever he gave him the painting. And it makes a lot of sense for Mike's character because he just thinks that Eleven is so cool. Like, obviously, who wouldn't? She has superpowers, she's saved the world multiple times, and she's kind of the first girl that paid attention to Mike and kind of just accepted him for who he is, kind of the way Max accepted Eleven for who she was. Mike is incredibly loyal. He's the heart of the group, so I think it does make the most sense for those characters to have a deeper bond and for their relationship to maybe last even into adulthood. And his speech to her whenever she was fighting Vecna was so very emotional, and I just love those displays whenever you can see how much characters care for one another outside the surface level conventions of like romantic relationships or friendships. Like these characters are really in the worst situations you can be in. So I just think this show does an excellent job at showing just how deep those bonds run. And speaking of Will and Mike in that painting, oh boy, did Noah Schnapp just do an absolute like amazing performance whenever he was talking to Will and sort of giving that speech and then him just like breaking down in tears afterwards and Jonathan watching him just really got me. I, I just was like, man, I feel it for this kid. He is just really going through it. So I hope that Will gets some happy moments in season five. I hope that Will and Mike become besties again. I hope Will gets himself a nice boyfriend. I feel like first love, especially unrequited first love, is always just extremely painful. So even if like Will and Mike don't work out as a couple, I think it could be a good way to show a character growing from that and finding like love and happiness in a new person in a different place. Or it could even end with Will finding love and happiness just amongst his friends. Like he's also kind of the glue. Like whenever he was talking about Mike being the glue in the heart of the group, I was also like, you know, but Will kind of also plays that role. He is Will the Wise. He is sort of like the guy that when everyone else is running after girls and all these other problems, he's like, dudes, let's just play some D&D. Can we play D&D please? Which I think the show kind of plays off as, oh, he's immature. He just hasn't done a whole lot of growing up. But I think at the end of the day, he just wants to hang out with his friends and the people he loves the way he always has. And I think the idea that that is immature is just a little bit shallow, you know? Chasing girlies does not make you a functional adult. I'm looking at you, Steve Harrington. But I'm once again getting way off topic. The relationships in this show just really get me. They're sort of like a model that I want to emulate in my own writing if I ever do any of that. There's just so much to talk about with every character and I know I'm not going to get to them all, but I do want to talk about Hopper a little bit. I think his arc this season was amazing, beautiful. I like how they did kind of a 180 with his character this season because honestly, Mr. Toxic Masculinity was not winning any points from me in season three. It was played for humor and it was kind of funny at some points, but at the end of the day, he was just being a huge jerk because he was depressed and felt out of control in his life. And he was honestly probably just really sexually frustrated too. So apparently doing some time in a Russian prison does wonders for your attitude. But I think the insight that we got on his character while he was there talking to the other prisoners was really interesting. Just talking about how he's not cursed, he is the curse and how he's just bringing all these negative things to the people in his life. And then talking about how it was kind of his fault that his daughter died because he had a child, even though he was exposed to dangerous chemicals and his child probably would have had birth defects. It was just really sad to see him in that low place even though I think it is what his character needed to sort of perk up whenever he saw that oh wait my friends love me enough to come all the way to Russia and get captured by a smuggler and taken into this prison to like try to save me. You can just see it in David Harper's performance because he was even talking about how he thought that she died and he couldn't believe that she was alive and I think just seeing that has maybe given him a second lease on life and realized 
oh, people were devastated when they thought I was dead. People came to my funeral. I, I think he has a renewed sense of, hey, maybe I'm not a curse for the people in my life. Maybe I can do good for them. And then just seeing his reunion with Eleven at the end of the series, it just shows like what a good dad he actually is, even though he can be like a huge jerk at times. I think he has this renewed sense of duty towards his daughter and towards Joyce and the people of his life. And I honestly just want to see like that unit of the buyers and the hoppers join together and be a little family because Eleven and Will are already siblings, you know? And Jonathan too, but he's off. He's too high, you know? But I would love to see their story end with all of them on a little dinner date at Enzo's. Like Joyce, Hopper, and the kids just hanging out, having a good time, eating some spaghetti you know what I'm saying? I have a horrible feeling that it's not going to end that way and someone from that family is going to die. I really hope not, but it could happen. But you know what? I can dream. I think that would be a good ending to their story. And you know what? I was actually talking to my brother when we were watching the finale and I was like, you know what would be super subversive and different for them to do? If none of the main characters died at all through the end of the show that would be cool and different because I feel like we have this expectation in stories that for there to be stakes, one of the main characters has to just die. And it's like, you know what? It'd be kind of cool to see a show not kill any main characters and somehow still remain engaging and have stakes. Like, honestly, I think they've managed to do that so far. And even after season four, none of the main characters have died. It's just our beloved side characters like Bob and Eddie that get introduced and die in the same season. I'm not bitter, but anyways, I've been going for too long and I kind of need to wrap things up here. So to end, I kind of want to talk about characters that are on the periphery of the show. Beginning with Nancy, I know that she's kind of like a main character, but I think she's been made more prominent in this season. I love her role as the character with all the brain cells amongst the teens because it's just, it's hilarious. I honestly love how she's the only one who knows what she's doing. Everyone else is just an idiot. Like Steve and Robin are a himbo herbo duo and I adore them. And Eddie is just like this idiot metalhead. Like they're just devoid of brain cells. And then we have Jonathan and Argyle over in California, just high as a kite with these like younger teens running the show and they're the only ones who know what they're doing like it's just so funny to me how everyone is so stupid like the teens and the young young adults are so dumb i love it i'm here for it though but they do a good job they came up with a decent plan in the end i love how the teen troop were like yep you know what we're just gonna go into the upside down and kill vecna and it's definitely going to work and i was like wow you know what? That's kind of bold. I applaud you guys. That's a pretty sick plan. And it might have worked too if it wasn't for Vecna and just being omniscient and terrifying. I love that for them. I'm honestly also here for the teen love square that was sort of going on this season, even though like not direct. I think some of those relationships could maybe work. They've got something there. But honestly, I kind of hate this show for making me root for Steve and Nancy again a little bit. But like, honestly, Steve is my boy. He's such a sweetheart and it's mainly that I want him to be happy. I don't know if he's necessarily the best for Nancy because she has big dreams and goals. But I honestly am starting to believe like he would go and just like support her and work a normal job and just be like a super dad because that's who he is. It's, he's a dad. I, I'm like, wait a minute this might actually kind of work out for them. But then there's also Nancy and Robin, which I wouldn't mind seeing either. I honestly think it could maybe be pretty cute. I think that they have a pretty nice dynamic going on. And I would honestly prefer that to Robin's current crush. I kind of hope that that doesn't go anywhere just because, I don't know, I think Robin can do a little better. I found it a little weird that her love interest was so similar to her in terms of how she looks and her personality. I know they were going for the whole Maldi Ringwald thing, but I think just the personality and the presence of that character is so similar to Robin that it reads a little bit weird on screen. Like I could buy them even as sisters because they're just so similar. And I don't know. I don't know if that's like really the dynamic you want for 
a love interest kind of relationship. Like, they could turn me around on it. They could do something that was like, okay, these characters have a bond. But right now, it just seems like they're kind of connecting and understanding each other based on the fact that they kind of move at the same wavelength, which makes sense. But I'm a little bit more partial to the opposites attract kind of trope on television. I kind of feel like Robin would be good with someone who grounded her a little bit more. And I personally think a Nancy type character would do a better job of doing that. And while we're talking about periphery characters, um, I really liked Erica's role in this season, coming into the D&D group and kind of like toning her character down, maturing her a little bit because she was like really giving sassy child last season. And I was like, whoa, I think moving her into more of a leadership position is going to be a good idea for like this season and future seasons because she's really serving future president of the United States, honestly, especially with the American flag cape. Like we all see it. Michelle Obama, who I think you meant Erica Sinclair. And of course, we got Chrissy and Eddie which I think the Duffer brothers have even gone on the record of being like, oh, we're kind of sad that we killed off Chrissy so soon. That was probably going to be an interesting character to explore. And I would have loved that because I love how it's like, oh, she's a cheerleader. She's dating like the captain of the basketball team. She seems like she's got all that, but it's then very realistic to go and look into what's going on in her personal life. And it's like, okay, she has some very serious baggage. She has an emotionally abusive mother. She might have an eating disorder. And then you have the brighter side of her life and what could have been with Eddie and if she maybe ended up in circles that were a little bit less socially rigid with people who understood her a little bit better. And when I think about that character, it's just so tragic that her life ended the way it did. Like, it's truly, truly awful. But I love how in the end, even though Eddie was going to sell her hard drugs, he was trying to be a good friend to Chrissy. So at least she had one good friend in the end. It wasn't just her psychotic boyfriend, but dude, Eddie, Edward. Oh my gosh. Why did they have to do that to me? I think the entire internet's going to have a similar reaction, but absolutely a character that I think they killed off too soon. He was great. He fit into the ensemble of characters perfectly and he brought this like nice edginess on the outside but then like heart of gold on the inside kind of presence to the group that feels different from any of the other teens. I adore his bond with Dustin. Watching them fight like brothers was just it was everything because it's like Eddie is the brother Dustin could have had. Like they, they have similar vibe. They even kind of look alike in some ways. And I love how Steve even like got a little bit jealous at some points. He's like, oh my gosh, Henderson, are you replacing me? Is he the new Steve? And I kind of thought he was the new Steve because I thought they were going to kill off Steve. But no, they killed off Eddie and my boy died too early. And I honestly feel like they could have given his death higher stakes because it sort of felt like he's just doing this so that he can be a hero and buy a little bit more time because in the end I don't think it really mattered a whole lot because Vecna knew their plan. He knew that like Steve and Robin and Nancy were going to try to come and kill him so there wasn't really a point for the demo bats to be away from the grill house at that point. Maybe it kept them preoccupied, I don't know, but in the end I kind of don't care because it did give Eddie an opportunity to play some sick metal music, which was one of the coolest scenes in the show. That was simply incredible, 10 out of 10. And finally, to wrap things up, we're gonna talk a little bit about VH1, which is Vecna Henry One. <laughs> Honestly, what an impressive way to tie all of these villain plot lines together. Whenever the season started, I was like, okay, who is this demonic looking, swamp thing looking monster coming in and just offing people in Hawkins? What's going on with this? We haven't seen this before. This is kind of wild. And then it got into the like Victor Creel arc and you're thinking, oh, Victor might have something to do with this. And they sort of slid it in there that his son, Henry, didn't actually die from the quote-unquote demon. He slipped into a coma and then died shortly after. And you're like, huh. When I first watched that, in the back of my mind, I was like, coma? We didn't see a body? This kid probably isn't actually dead. But in no universe did I actually expect him to be Vecna slash one. And I think when we were watching the flashbacks with L and one, all of us expected this random orderly or whatever he was to be one. He was just like hinting at it. Like, I think it was pretty obvious from the beginning. Okay, this is one. He's going to have powers. But I think they did a good job of kind of 
hiding a less obvious plot twist in an obvious plot twist and being like, yes, this is one, but guess what? He's also Vecna and he's also Henry. And you're just like, wait a second. I was so busy thinking I had it all figured out that I didn't see the other hints that were right in front of me. I love it when writing does that. I think it's super cool. And I honestly think it's a wonderful way to kind of tie everything together with the upside down. And we don't really know how much is planned from the beginning. I know some of this is probably retcons and sort of tying loose ends together retroactively, but it was said that the Duffer brothers have like a 20 page document outlining all the creatures and all the spooky mayhem that exists in the Upside Down. So I'm almost positive that this character and this concept probably existed from the beginning. It's just finding a way to organically throw him in there that was the challenge. And looking back on everything, it actually makes sense. Like you can hear clock chimes and bells throughout the score of the show all the way back as early as season one there are clock chimes when will byers is taken for the first time like that's wild i don't know if they planned that if that was just part of the sound design for the show and then it turned into a plot point but it is very well executed either way if that's a retcon then like that is honestly brilliant writing because they found a way to make it seem like it was the plan all along and i also love the progression of the monsters i feel like you can tell in season one it's almost as if vecna wasn't strong enough to psychically control more than one monster so he controls the demogorgon and he goes after people trying to take them and absorb absorb them so that he can get stronger and he's a little bit successful in season one he takes a couple of people he gets stronger and then he gains access to someone he can possess on the outside with will so in season two a bit of the vine grows into demodogs and then they expand and you've got all the things with the tunnels and the vines and he levels up a little bit with the demodogs and he can control more of them with the hive mind and we can see the portal expanding and getting bigger but then when the portal is closed at the end of season two he has to rely on the little bit of part Articles that escape from Will Byers to then go in season three to possess a bunch of rats and then eventually create a flesh monster to try to take Eleven's powers because he knows that's the only way he's going to become strong enough to actually take over Hawkins and he does he gets her powers and that's why he's so strong in season four and why he's able to do more psychic damage now and I love the cheat that they did by fake killing Max so that the upside down could open up into Hawkins and we can have those higher stakes while still having potential for that characters to stay alive in season five. I am super excited to see where they go with Vecna in the future because we know that he's only going to get stronger. Brenner warned Eleven about this and I'm interested to see what like psychic battle shenanigans they're going to get into because I think we all know that Eleven's not going to be able to fight an entire army. She's going to have to go into his brain and do some like Pennywise level stuff. Maybe she's going to get with Argyle and take some mushrooms. I don't know what they're going to do. But we know that Stephen King is a huge influence on the Duffer Brothers as well as classic horror movie villains like Michael Myers and Freddy Krueger. So I think we're going to see tropes at play and tropes subverted with his character. And I am so here for it. I love having such a cool villain in this series. And can we talk about how sick that closing shot of the season was? I mean, we finally had Will feeling the influence of the Mind Flayer again now that he's back in Hawkins. I love that they actually followed up on that plot thread because I was wondering where it was. And then the final shot with Hellfire literally spewing out of the earth and we can see the plants are dying in the similar way that they did with the pumpkins in season two. I love leaving off there and just looking at that and being like, okay, how the heck our heroes gonna win against that. Some people are thinking time travel because there's been an awful lot of Back to the Future references in the show. I don't know how many people noticed this, but the meeting point for all four gates when they opened up was a clock tower in the middle of Hawkins. And then the shape of the gates kind of looked like the Mind Flare. I just thought that was really cool. I think it's foreshadowing. I'm here for it. I'm so excited to see it. I'm sure I'm going to have more theories. I'm probably going to rewatch the show so that I can think about it even more. But I have rambled for long enough. So that is it for this video. And here are the finished pieces. I had so much fun working on these, especially with how colorful the screenshots were. Stranger Things definitely has some of my favorite cinematography, so it was so fun to study these almost. And I will say next time I'm going to be using a bigger canvas because 1080p was way too small for these, but you know what? It is what it is. Hello there. If for some reason you're still here, 
Thanks for watching till the end of the video. I know this was definitely a long one, but I appreciate those of you who stay till the end. If you would like to, please leave some suggestions for other redraw episodes I could do. And for the love of all that is good, please help me come up with a better name for this series other than just screenshot redraw, screen cap redraw. It's super freaking boring. That's all from me. If you want to support what I do here, you can like, comment, subscribe, and turn on notifications and check out my store. When you do, you become an honorary leaf because I wouldn't be a pile of leaves without you guys. But for now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go sit in my bathtub blindfolded with a shower on in the efforts to revive a very special coma patient. Bye! Good boy.